He has publicly declared that Negroes living on his plantation, working or not, have a home for life. One of his neighbors is Negro activist Fannie Lou Hamer, one of the founders of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. To her, the senator's generosity has a hollow ring. Senator Easton has never done nothing for nobody poor, not in this county. Because the people on Senator Eastland's plantation is just as poor as I am. And he hadn't done anything for them. And he hadn't done anything for nobody else that's poor in Sunflower County. And I've been right here in Sunflower County since I was two years old. Within sight of the busy cotton gin she has supplied with her labor in these fields, Mrs. Irene Taylor lives with her family of nine. Hers is one of the few remaining tenant shacks that grace the senator's plantation. Well, I think he might have nice about that because uh, he told me to stay there as long as I want to stay in that house. I'm in. He said, as long as I live, as long as I want to stay in the house, I could stay there. But and I... any kind of help that uh, he said that if I need amongst my children kind of sickness, he'll help me sometimes. Some of Senator Eastland's tenants left the plantation to talk with reporter Nick Kotz. They came to talk about hunger, but water and electricity and the minimum necessities kept creeping into the conversation. In the society of indebtedness, the food bill is the last bill. You know, you have to pay tax on that money, what you borrow. You know, any money you borrow is two bits on a dollar. You, you know that. No, go over that. In other words, when you borrow money from Senator Eastland, you've got to pay an interest? Yeah, I had to pay interest on it. Tell us about that. Go all the way through and tell us how that works. Yeah, see, when I borrow it, just like I borrow it, thirty dollars. Well, I'm going to pay two bits on it, every one of them dollars I borrowed from him. So they're not getting anything free. If they loan the money, they might have to pay that double instead of just paying maybe ten percent on the dollar. They're not giving them anything. The elderly are at the bottom of the poverty class. Mr. Edwards here shares quarters with two people who are not even related to him. Medical expenses consume their meager incomes. For the old, food stamps are a distant dream. Food stamps are all right if he's able to buy them. Of course, uh, they say we'd have to pay $28 and they give us $22, which would make 50 Tell us about what your family is going to eat until... Well, they'll eat some turnip greens and some cornbread, all I know, because I don't have anything else. And I don't have no money to buy nothing with. I don't have no job. I have been trying to get one, but I can't. And the boy, yeah, he, I need some money now for him. He finishing school. I got to pay that money off for him, you know, in school. And he's graduating from high school to go trying to go to college. Do you feel that your seven children are getting enough food to eat right now, this week? No, I don't think they are. He can't, he, you know, he can't choose the food if he doesn't have the money to buy the stamp. It might would give him dignity if, you know, if he had something he could do and then, you know, had enough money that he could buy the stamp. But he can't hold up his head in dignity if he got to go up there and listen to people telling me, well, you better have some money, you better get you a job because you, you won't get the stamp for $3 next month because that's happening too. We find that a lot of poor people say they can't afford stamps. They don't realize they have been spending a lot more money for food than it would take them to get uh, the food stamps. And uh, it takes education to reach them. And then, of course, it takes nutrition education to teach them what to buy and when, and how to prepare it so they'll get a maximum benefit from it. Charlie Edwards' generation may wonder at the ways of Washington, but it's too old to make any demands. But when Mr. Edwards looks at Doddsville through the eyes of his son returning from Vietnam, it's a different point of view. I think he ought to have some of what he, he needs. I think he ought to have a good home to live in. I think he ought to have baths in his house. I think he ought to have everything that a poor man could have, especially when he went up against what's going on in Vietnam. So I think so myself, if I had to go to Vietnam, I think if I went and took all the punishment, and everything happened to me while I was in Vietnam, 
and then come back home and couldn't have a decent bed to lay down in and not a decent job, I don't think I'd feel like ever going back no more. It was for my country. I wouldn't feel like this for my country. Not especially for my part of it, for me. <laughs> I feel like this for the other fellas did to me. When I think about that and how hungry people are in the South, then it makes me a little sick to say, how can they spend all that much money in another country and really not doing nothing at home? See, I think charity began at home and then spread abroad. Frown out that your children trying to change your life. Frown out about the promise on the other side. Yeah. Oh, you'll find out choosing Israelite.